Uh, this one, just before we do get started, I want to again wish everyone a happy Hanukkah and perhaps more appropriately, appropriately happier Hanukkah in the future. My quote this morning is from Robert Record, The Castle of Knowledge. He wrote that in 1556, very many centuries ago. He says, if reason's reach transcend the sky, why should it then to earth be bound? The wit is wronged and let awry if mind be focused on the gr in the ground. Uh -huh. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wendy will be here shortly. She just had another meeting before and she's kind of just transitioning. She'll be here, she'll be here in a bit. Okay, Gary Melton I know was, wanted to be here. Lenny, Marty Cohn, these are people that, that told us, Ricky. Is everyone having a problem with the with the link in this morning? Is that what the issue is? Not I. Not you. No. Okay. First time I got right in. Been enjoying the uh, back and forth. We're glad to see you, Rabbi. It's good to be here. Thank you, Stephen. Hello. Yes, same to you. Rabbi, I have a question. I'll try to have an answer, Gail. Okay, well, it's actually your comment, I guess. There's something in the conservative movement called eco kashrut uh, right. to supplement the traditional kosher certification with one called Hesher Zedek, or justice certification, which can- Hesher, right? H-E-K, Hesher. That's from, from kosher, right. Hey. Which, which, consists with excuse me which considers additional factors such as the treatment of animals the impact on the environment and fairness to workers right very interesting very right. interesting right they um i i don't know exactly of, um how uh when when they started doing that i know they started doing some of the some of the research research the conservative movement has what they call a committee on jewish law and standards uh and uh issues uh what we in the reform movement call respond responsa people that, okay. you know, uh, okay. up, okay. updating right okay. updating specific um uh, uh Responses okay, I show to you. Questions. There you are. Okay. Bye bye. There's okay. There's Gary. The um, and uh, probably in the 1980s, uh, a, a new generation of of young activist rabbis, um, cynically, I might say, of of. Uh, 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 of young young rabbis and and community leaders who um, no longer had e either the Vietnam War or civil rights or Soviet Jewry or or some other particular cause celebra, and they started to turn towards environmental issues. And and one of the that then then the uh, the approaches was to to try to bring to the mainstream. Uh, movements, some kind of a, uh, encourage them to make some kind of a statement about environmental concerns, about um, uh, justice for workers, uh, you know, those things that, that, that you're mentioning. Um, within the reform movement that with which I'm more, more familiar, that focused on advocacy and on programming within congregations, religious schools, there was a whole wave beginning around, right around 2000, a whole wave of uh, synagogues that were building new buildings that, that applied for LEED, uh, L-E-E-D, you know, certification for um, ecologically sensitive and, 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 and things like that. Um, and and um, recycling and at, at conventions and conferences and youth group meetings, everything was focused on now let's focus, let, let, let's learn about recycling, environmental issues. In the conservative movement, they, they went through this committee on law and standards and, and they came up with not only a statement, 
that you're referring to, the Heckscher Tzedek, of, make, of, tzedek of, of kosher responding to not only God's word, but also to human need, uh, you know, to, for those issues that are important to us today as, as a statement of righteousness, of tzedek, of, of justice and, and, and righteousness. Um, so they published new uh, Haggadahs for Passover. They, they did a lot of work on liturgy for Tu Bishvat um, and, and things like that. So it's, it's probably within the last 25, certainly a generation right. of younger rabbinic and academic leadership. Now, very progressive, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, a lot of leadership. I'm mean, again, I'm I'm not that familiar with the with with all of the people who are in the movement, but but the Reconstructionist movement, the Renewal movement. Um, a lot of them were based in um, uh, it, with the writing of uh, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Arthur Wasco in Philadelphia. Um, they they followed a lot of a lot of his stuff. Um, the uh, well, you're a Torah study person, so if you remember, like the uh, the laws of Noah, that that you know that preceded the the idea of the mitzvot, and so Wasco had a whole thing that he said, well, there we should have a new Noahide covenant, uh, you, you know, lest the world be destroyed again, and and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Chag Sameach again. Okay, Ruthann, you're you're muting everybody. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to the the model that I'd like to 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 use for this, at least for the next few months, um, is that we spend a couple of minutes summarizing the preceding two or three sometimes maybe even four different Torah portions so that lead up to the weekly portion. And then when we get to the weekly portion, um, I will, I'd like to focus, rather than reading the entire thing, is focus maybe on one chapter or one or two specific um, sections. Uh, and, and what do we glean? We'll look at, I'll look at, I'll introduce you to some of the the traditional as well as contemporary commentators, and then uh, have have discussion about on what what the 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 issue or the theme might particularly how it might particularly apply uh, to us today. So that's that's the goal and the format that I'd like to pursue, uh, and I would certainly be open to your to your feedback uh, as to whether you find it uh, stimulating uh, and educational. Um, uh, again, in, in the future, uh, I'm, I, I certainly would invite people to prepare uh, a, a, a few minute summary of one of the Torah portions, the preceding ones that led us up to the day Gary accepted the invitation. So he's going to be he's going to be third. I'll do a I'll do a quick run through of the uh, of the preceding portions leading up and then Gary will do last week's portion. Uh, actually, from only two days ago, when we when we read it in the in the Torah in the in the synagogue, um, and then we'll go on from there. Um, and if you need any help, if you want to do that, but if you need any help or need any resources, just let me know, and I can certainly provide provide to you. So so then here we actually go back to um, three portions ago um, was. Um, uh, uh, and, and to put it into context, uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob and his uh, twin brother Esau, who's the who's the older one, and there are issues. Uh, they're the they're the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. There are issues between the two of them, and um, uh, for a, a number of reasons, which we'll hold off till next year or whatever it is. For uh, for a number of reasons, um, Jacob. Uh, Jacob leaves, leaves home um, and uh, at his mother's insistence, and um, and he's going uh, uh, going to try to uh, Haran, which is the native his mother's uh, native native home. 
uh, on, uh, on the eve of his departure, uh, you, if you remember a little bit of the story, and we'll do the highlights here, um, Jacob uh, uh, makes a, goes to sleep in, in, in a particular place, and he makes a pillow out of, out of a stone, and he dreams of a stairway uh, or a ladder that, that's reaching up to, up to heavens, and angels are going up and down. Uh, again, it's kind of interesting that the angels go up first rather than come down from heaven, but they go up and they go up and down is the way that they're described. Uh, God uh, appears to Jacob, whether it's in the dream and tells him that his descendants will be, uh, will be many, they'll be spread out in all directions, north, south, east, west, um, that all peoples will be blessed by them. Ultimately, God will bring him back to his to his homeland, uh, that in other words, that the blessing given originally to his grandfather to Abraham will be continued through him. Uh, Jacob wakes up and calls the place Bethel, that means uh, house of God, and promises or makes a vow that if God will indeed protect him, that he will worship God and God alone, and he will also set aside a tithe, uh, 10% uh, of his of his wealth and his property, and uh, set that aside for God. He continues on his journey, arrives in in Haran, um, uh, meets meets Rachel, the daughter of Lavan. Um, uh, uh, Jacob introduces himself. Uh, she runs to inform her father. Lavan uh, greet, greets him as a member of the tribe, as my bone and flesh. Uh, as a kinsman, and um, Laban says, Levan says to Jacob, um, how should I pay you for the work that you're doing for me? Jacob, who has fallen in love with Rachel, answers, well, I'll serve you for seven years if you give me Rachel as a wife. Um, Levan agrees, but after, but then after the seven years, he tricks, uh, tricks, tricks Jacob and sends the older sister, Leah, into the, into the wedding tent, um, in, in place of Rachel, uh, Jacob, the next morning, not right away, but the next morning, Jacob complains to, uh, to Levan, why have you deceived me this way? Levan tells him, it's not, the, it's not our practice to marry off the younger before the older. So if you work for seven more years, uh, you can have Rachel as well. It's obviously polygamous society and Jacob agrees. Um, uh, after this time, uh, Leah first gives birth to uh, Reuben, Simeon, or in Hebrew, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda, Judah. Rachel is jealous and upset that she can't have children, so she sends her maidservant, just as Sarah had done with Abraham, so she sends her maidservant, Bilhah, to Jacob to have children for her. Bilhah bears Don and Naphtali, uh, Leah also instructs her other um, maidservant, Zilpah, to go in with Jacob, Jill, and Zilpah gives birth to Gad and Asher, and afterwards, Leah gives more, has, has more, more, two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun, and the daughter, Dina, and finally, Rachel conceives and bears the son, Joseph, who will become the favorite one, and we will be encountering Joseph much later on when we get to this week's portion. Um, after Joseph is born, Jacob approaches Lavan, his father-in-law. Uh, it's time for me to, to leave and go back to my homeland. Um, and there are issues between uh, uh, Jacob and Lavan. We don't have to go into all of those, all of those details. But um, uh, and and uh, uh, Leah and and Rachel's brothers get involved, uh, also accusing Jacob of stealing from from their father. Uh, uh, Rachel actually steals one of her father's um, idols, and uh, Jacob's accused of doing that. And, and it, 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 it's, um, it's ironic that it, that it matches a lot of the issues that we've seen with the matriarchs and patriarchs uh, earlier on, and this, the theme of deceit. Um, uh, matter of fact, Yaakov or Jacob actually means a heel. Now, not, not that a heel in early Semitic literature meant someone who was uh, deceitful, whatever, but it's interesting that we have that, that connection even in, even in English. 
Um, Jacob answers he was afraid to reveal his plans, but that he really hasn't taken anything that belonged to Lavan. Um, Rachel had had cleverly hidden the idol that 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 she uh, uh, that she had taken, and uh, Jacob said, "Look, you know why shouldn't there just be peace between us?" Um, um, uh, and that they they do make peace with each other, and the to the first Torah portion that we're talking about, Vayetze, concludes with uh, the the two of them, Jacob and Levan, setting up a a pillar of stones, a milepost, uh, promising that they will not cross against each other with hostile intent. Uh, the next portion uh, begins with the um, with the familiar encounter and uh, a, a lot of uh, literary tension as Jacob, the night before, Jacob is going to meet up uh, either with or against his brother Esau. They haven't seen each other in all these years. And uh, the last time that they were together, of course, was fraught with, uh, with, with, with tension and, and we, we don't know what to anticipate. Jacob doesn't either. Is this going to be a peaceful reconciliation? Is this going to be a battle? What what's actually going to uh, going to happen? Jacob sends messengers on ahead to Esau, hoping that they will return with a message of of peace. Um, and they they come back and they tell Jacob that Esau's coming. He has four hundred men with him. Uh, Jacob is terrified and divides his community, his family into into two camps. Uh, so he reasons that if Esau attacks one, the other will be able to uh, to escape. Uh, Jacob spends the night in in prayer um, and um, takes his takes his family to a safe place. And then we have another encounter, uh, another famous story that uh, Jacob wrestles. Uh, take your choice. Jacob wrestles with a man, wrestles with Esau, wrestles with an angel, or wrestles with himself. Again, uh, Torah study, and if we come back to this next year, we'll have time to really. Uh, delve into what that wrestling match might have actually meant. Um, but uh, his, his, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, Yisrael, ki sarita im Elohim, because you have striven, you have wrestled with, with God, vatuchal, and uh, doesn't really mean that you've emerged victorious. It means that you have emerged uh, capable of going on, of moving forward after this particular uh, particular encounter. Um, uh, Jacob, uh, the next morning, Jacob does uh, see Esau and they run to each other. And instead of it being a hostile moment, it's a, it's a reconciliation. They, they hug and they kiss. Uh, Esau asks, who are, who are these people with you? This is my family and my wives, my children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Jacob says to Esau, to see your face is like seeing the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Um, they, they uh, uh, also they agree on who's going to live, who's going to live where. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, leftover uh, reluctance about the uh, the birthright and who's going to follow in the uh, uh, what will become known as the Israelite clan leadership. Um, there's an there's an incident with um, the story of, of Dina, who's the one daughter of, of Jacob and Leah, who is uh, who's uh, raped by uh, one of the one of the locals, um, and whether or not uh, Jacob and his brother and and his other sons uh, will will allow the two of them to uh, to get married. Uh, and there's a very, very awkward and difficult, complex story that kind of interposes um, in here, where the, where the brothers, in a in a, Middle, a typical Middle Eastern fashion that we even hear horror stories about today, uh, that the that the brothers totally slaughter uh, all the family of Shechem and uh, to protect their their sisters' uh, honor and reputation. 
uh, God appears to Jacob again and tells him to return to Bethel, which is the place where he had uh, laid down to sleep and put the uh, the pillow the, the stone down as his pillow and God blesses him again now whether that's a return visit or whether that's just another author's retelling of the same story and it gets put in here in a different uh, chronology we're not really sure but the the blessing to Jacob is uh, is reaffirmed as the same blessing that was given to Isaac and to Abraham before them um they uh they go to uh, a place called Ephrat uh which uh, it says now which is now known as Bethlehem or Beit Lechem Ephrat is in present day Israel is, is a is a Jewish suburb of Bethlehem which is a which is a Palestinian Christian uh city for the most part um and uh on the way there Rachel uh, who had been pregnant one last time, uh, she gives birth to the youngest, that's Benjamin, uh, but she dies, she dies uh, giving birth. Uh, she's buried on the way to Bethlehem, and indeed tourists and, and, um, uh, and pilgrims visit her, visit her grave. It's on the main road between, going south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to this, uh, to this very day. Um, Isaac dies at at 180 years old, longer than uh, older, older than Moses even, um, and Esau and Jacob come together to bury him there at the cave of Machpelah in the city of Hebron, which is also south of uh, south of Bethlehem too. So, so there are those two quick summaries um, of the two portions that takes us up to the portion that we read last week, which is Vayeshev. And Gary, if you unmute yourself and want to give us your summary and highlights, I'd appreciate it. Gary, you're not, you're still, you're still muted. There we go. Yes, no. We're having we're having issues today. There you are. Okay. All right. All right. Gotcha. So, uh, so where Jacob is settled in the land and Can land of Canaan and uh, about his line and uh, then Joseph, his uh, boy of seventeen, that's out uh, with the flocks and talks about Joseph with his brothers and how Joseph. Uh, becomes Jacob or Israel. He, he's kind of on and off referred to as Jacob and Israel, uh, but Joseph is his favorite son. And he uh, he talks to the point where he makes him that, that uh, coat of, uh, uh, they, they don't call it a coat, but of many colors. And the brothers are more and more jealous of, of Joseph. And then Joseph has a couple dreams. And um, as he relays these dreams to his brothers, it always seems like the dreams are about uh, you know, them bowing down to him and, and, and puts him in a kind of a, an upper position. And on the second dream, even his father um, berates him, uh, criticizes him for, um, for having and relating this, this dream that he has. So at, this gets to the point where the brothers are out and uh, taking care of that. They've gone a, a distance away to take care of the herds, the flocks, not herds, flocks, I guess it's sheep. Uh, and, and the father sends Joseph out to check on them because Joseph has always been one of the reasons the father likes Joseph is he, he kind of tells them what's going on, what's really going on, and are they doing what they're supposed to be doing. So Joseph goes out there. Um, he doesn't find them exactly where they're supposed to be, but an elder man uh, lets them know that, no, he, they've moved on to another location. He then um, continues on to that location. As the brothers see him coming, they plot to uh, initially to kill him. Uh, one of the brothers, um, we get this right, Reuben, uh, uh, talks to them and, and uh, says, no, let's not shed blood. Let's just, uh, let's put him in a pit and uh, um, let's not, let's not kill him. Uh, then um, uh, what occurs is they, they actually do put him into a pit. And then the other brother, not Reuben, um, uh, Judah says, uh, let's, uh, 
uh, let's uh, they see a caravan coming. Let's let's sell let's sell them to a caravan, and they'll take him to Egypt. And uh, then we don't have to do anything. And they have they have taken when he arrives, when Joseph arrives to his brothers, they take his coat off him because they were going to use that coat uh, originally as a, and they still do. So see, they, they they're going to. Uh, they're going to put blood on the coat and tell the father that he was killed by a wild animal, which ultimately they do do, but uh, he ends up not, not being killed. Uh, where it was uh, a little confusing to me was um, there was this caravan that was coming, uh, Eshlemite caravan from Gilead, uh, but then um, there was also these Mennonite traders who actually found Joseph and um, and then supposedly the, the Mennonites then sold him to the uh, the uh, Ishmaelite folks for twenty pieces of silver, and they took him to Egypt. But uh, in the reading that I've got, it actually kind of contradicts that, and, and I've you know not run across that before. But uh, where they um, they 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 it just it was confusing because they say brother Joseph. Uh, Judah suggested they sell him, uh, and then um, they can't find him. Of course, he's not in the pit because the Mennonites have taken him out of the pit. But then it refers back to uh, um, uh, the Edomites delivering him to Egypt. But there's it, it, it just a point in there. I'd have to show it to you. But at some point, it's, it read kind of confusing, like the Mennonites didn't have him, but they did have him. So anyway, he gets he gets they get he gets taken to Egypt. Uh, he uh, uh, he uh, his brother his brother his brother um, that was going to take him out of the pit. The one that recommended they put him in the pit was going to actually actually go back and try and save him. He evidently wasn't with the other brothers, and he came back and couldn't find him in the pit. Uh, and uh, um, ultimately, they. I don't know what ha he didn't know what happened to him, but he did put blood on Joseph's coat and take it back to his father. Um, the, in, in the meantime, the Mennonites had sold him in Egypt to a courtier, courtier of the pharaoh, uh, and um, uh, Judah left his brothers uh, and, um, and 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 just left him completely. It goes off on kind of another story where he marries uh, uh, a Canaanite's daughter. And it goes through a series of uh, where his kids uh, that they have, they all seem to not uh, find favor with the Lord, and the Lord kills them. Uh, and that that moves along. Um, uh, and um, uh, Judah asks, uh, uh, there's, there's one interesting point in it where Judah asks the, 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 the widow of, um, of his first son, to stay um, in his home because uh, he's got a younger son, uh, Shema, who's uh, when he gets older that he would then try to marry her off. But uh, what she's seen is that every every one of his sons that uh, you know after the first son uh, he asked her to marry the or the he asked the second son to take her on and then he was killed. So um, ultimately um, sh she ends up uh, kind of. Finding out, she went. She went back to her father's home. She didn't stay uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in Judah's home. And uh, Judah's wife dies. And sometime after that, um, she finds out he's coming to Tima, and um, she Tamar is her name. She pretends to be a harlot and um, convinces him to uh, lie down with her and and bears him a son. And he's. Uh, he finds out uh, about it and is going to have her burned, but then she provides the symbols and stuff to show him that you know she's who she was. She's who she was, and um, he had given her these things uh, as a, a, I, I don't know the term they use, but when he when she agreed to uh, lie down with him, uh, he still owed her a kid, which he never could find her after that. So. That that never got never got given. But ultimately, he d decides he's done as much wrong as she has, and uh, he doesn't he doesn't uh, doesn't burn her. Um, she she does have twins uh, in her uh, by him, and then it's, then it cuts out on 
portion to chapter number 39, and it goes back to Joseph, who's in Egypt, and how well he did with his master and how well he was liked. And um, uh, then he ran into a problem where his wife, uh, the master's wife, wanted to uh, him to lie down with her. Um, she was attracted to him, and um, he, he continually refused. So got to the point where she got angry. She um, made up a, a kind of a, a situation where it looked like he may have uh, forced himself on her or tried to. Uh, ultimately, uh, her husband, uh, his uh, Joseph's master, has Joseph put into jail. And uh, Joseph becomes well liked in jail too, and and gets to a position where he's kind of a uh, he's a prisoner, but he's taking care of other other prisoners. And what happens at some point is the Pharaoh, his cupbearer and baker, do something that offends him. They end up in that prison, and Joseph is assigned to kind of take care of them, and he uh, watches over them and and takes care of whatever needs they have. I guess maybe it's a prison like uh, we have some for executives that they they get maybe taken better care of. I don't know. But um, they have dreams that disturb them, each of them. And um, Joseph interprets those two dreams. One works out pretty good. And the dream comes out. He tells the cupbearer that his dream means he's going to be released in three days. Uh, from from prison and re and restored, uh, and the other one, the baker, um, he's going to be impaled, <laughs> and, and uh, so the other one didn't have quite as good a fortune, but uh, those things did turn out to come true. The cupbearer was restored, and uh, the baker was impaled, and it kind of says the cupbearer kind of you know forgot about uh, you know about all this and about what Joseph did. Um, although they were pretty impressed with his ability to read dreams, and that's going to come up some more um, in the next section. Okay. Yashar Koach, as we say. Uh, you know, thank you, thank you for, uh, for teaching us, summarizing us. Um, so then to pick up the story, uh, the portion for this coming week is called Miketz, which means at the end of, uh, so at the end of the previous incident that Gary laid out for us, um, the cupbearer who is uh, in the inner circle of the Pharaoh's court, uh, Pharaoh has two dreams that none of his advisors can interpret, but the cupbearer says, ah, I remember that there was this guy I was in prison with, Joseph, who was very good at interpreting dreams. And look, he told me I was going to be released, and I am. And, and here I am. How about if we ask Pharaoh, if, if we ask Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dreams? Uh, and, and we know the story. Uh, it means that uh, Egypt will have seven, uh, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in, in charge of uh, in charge of the land and, and uh, uh, production and uh, uh, preparation. When the famine arrives, Jacob sends his sons, except for Benjamin, to Egypt because there was famine in, they were living in a place called Goshen, which is now near the Gaza Strip. Um, when they arrive pleading for, uh, well, not pleading for a handout necessarily, but they, they come to, to buy uh, rations because Egypt had plenty. Joseph recognizes them and accuses them of coming to spy on his land. They, they, they don't recognize him. How would they? Um, they were either the last they saw, it was either the Midianites or the Edomites or the Ishmaelites or whomever, whoever, whoever took them and sold them, sold them to, uh, uh, to Egypt. Um, they just tell him that they've come for food. They have an elderly father and one younger brother. Uh, Joseph has uh, Simeon, Shimon, um, and, and uh, uh, seizes him, holds on to him, tell the, tells the other brothers that he can't go free until they return with the youngest brother, whom uh, Joseph wants to, wants to see. It's a test of Jacob, uh, in a sense. Uh, he takes their money and sends them off with sacks of food. They discover that each of their sacks contain the money back that they had given to Joseph. And now they're concerned that uh, they're going to be accused of, of being robbers. As the famine worsens, 
Jacob tells his sons to return to Egypt again. They remind Jacob that they cannot return without Benjamin. Uh, Judah pledges that Benjamin will be safe. And when his brothers return to Egypt, Joseph frees Simeon, invites the brothers to his house for a big banquet. Um, he has not yet revealed his identity. He does another test. The banquet concludes, ordering that the brothers' bags be filled with more food and that the, his wine cup be secretly placed in Benjamin's bag. The brothers depart. Joseph sends his army after them, accuses them of stealing the wine cup. They reply that they have taken nothing. And when the wine cup is found in Benjamin's bag, the brothers are brought back to Joseph's house. He informs them that he will keep Benjamin as a slave, but release the rest of them. And tune in next week. That's 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 as far as we get. Although I think we all know what's going to happen. Oh, oh, Bev's even really, really fraught with tension here. Um, we, I think we all know what's going to happen. But what I would like to do is focus specifically on chapter forty-two. So if you do have a a Torah or a Genesis uh, text in front of you, um, I most people are muted again so I, I guess I'll just I'll just read it read it through but chapter 42 of Genesis is what we're talking about and then there I have two questions I neglected to say at the beginning I, I want to approach this as as much that I'm a student of rather than teaching the text okay I want to study the text with you so I can bring my um, uh, uh, the resources that I have, and the research that I've done and, you know, and whatever, but along with uh, the, the different experiences and the different insights that all of our, uh, uh, all of our different minds can bring to understanding the text. So I'm focusing on chapter 42, and there really are two questions that, I'll, that I wanna bring up within the context of this chapter. So, um, and again, some of us may have little different translations. If you have a question about it, you know, raise me, raise a question or uh, raise a hand or let me know. When, when Jacob saw that there were food rations to be held in Egypt, uh, he said to his sons, why do you keep looking at one another? Now I hear that there are rations to be had in Egypt. Go down and procure rations for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to get grain rations in Egypt. Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brother since he feared that he might meet with disaster. And when we talk about the 12 sons, you know, so there's, there's the 10 here, there's Joseph who's already in Egypt and Benjamin who is now left behind. Uh, thus the sons of Israel were among those who came to procure rations for the famine extended to the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was the vizier of the land it was he who dispensed rations to all the people. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed low to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he acted like a stranger toward them and spoke harshly to them. He asked them, where do you come from? They said, from the land of Canaan to procure food. For though Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Recalling the dreams that he had dreamed about them, Joseph said to them, you are spies. You have come to see the land in its nakedness. But they said to him, no, my Lord, truly your mercies have come to procure food. We are all of us sons of the same man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies. And he said to them, no, you have come to see the land in its nakedness. And they replied, we, your servants, were 12 brothers, sons of a certain man in the land of Canaan. The youngest, however, is now with our father and one is no more. That's Joseph. But Joseph said to them, it is just as I have told you, you are spies. By this you shall be put to the test. Unless your youngest brother comes here, by Pharaoh you shall not depart from this place. Let one of you go and bring your brother while the rest of you remain confined, that your words may be put to the test, whether there's truth in you. Else by Pharaoh you are nothing but spies. And he confined them in the guardhouse for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you shall live, for I am a God-fearing man. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be held in your place. He changed, changed the condition. Let one of your brothers be held in your place of detention while the rest of you go and take home rations for your starving households. But you must bring me back your youngest brother that your words may be verified that you may not die. 
They did accordingly. They said to one another, alas, we are being punished on account of our brother Joseph because we looked on and his anguish and yet paid no heed as he pleaded with us. That is why this distress has come upon us. Then Reuben spoke up and said to them, didn't I tell you do no wrong to the boy, but you paid no heed. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know that Joseph understood for there was, no, there, there was an, an interpreter between him and them. He turned away from them and wept, but he came back to them and spoke to them. And he took Simeon from among them and hid him bound before their eyes, had him bound before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, return each one's money to his sack and give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. So they loaded their asses with the rations and departed from there. As one of them was opening his sack to give feed to the ass at the night encampment, he saw his money right there at the mouth of his bag. He said to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my bag. Their hearts sank and trembling, they turned one to another and said, what is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had befallen them, saying, the man who is, loved, who is Lord of the land spoke harshly to us and accused us of spying on the land. We said to him, we are honest men. We have never been spies. There were 12 of us brothers, sons by the same father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in the land of Canaan. But the man who's Lord of the land said to us, by this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me. Take something of your, for your starving households and be off. Bring your youngest brother back to me that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will then restore your brother to you. You shall be free to move about in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each one's sack was his money bag. When they and their father saw the money bags, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, it is always me that you bereave. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Now you would take away Benjamin. These things have always happened to me. Then Reuben said to his father, you may kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my, put, put him in my care and I will return him to you. But, um, but uh, Jacob said, my son must not go down with you for his brother is dead and he alone is left. If he meets with disaster on the journey, you, on the journey you are taking, you will send my white head down to Sheol in grief. Okay. So there's, a, there's our story. Um, the, and I said, I, I have two, two questions that arise for discussion. Um, and we may want uh, whoever's in charge, I don't know, Ruthann or what, uh, we, we may have to unmute everybody. But the, the first question is, um, how do we understand Joseph and his reaction and response at this point? Um, and the, 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 the Jewish question is, um, is, uh, is he seeking revenge? Is he holding a grudge? Is he trying to teach them a lesson? What is, what is Joseph's main motivation in the way that he treats his brothers and has not uh, revealed himself to them at all? So I want, I want to cite to begin with um, uh, a couple of the, uh, the uh, commentators, uh, beginning with uh, Don Isaac Abravanel, who um, Spanish, uh, yeah, Ricky, do you want to go? Well, well, I have a question before you get into the main discussion. Okay. It's always bothered me. Well, uh, so, uh, let's see. When, so Jacob did not send Joseph. This is right at the beginning of verse four. Uh, Jacob did not send Joseph's brother, Benjamin, since he feared that he might meet with disaster. Why would he only fear that Benjamin would meet with disaster and not the whole bunch of them? Um, well, we've already learned about Jacob's character that he shows favorites. True. All right. Um, and yes. Rachel is Rachel is his favorite wife. We know that Benji is his Joseph favorite. and Benjamin. Benjamin is now the only son of his favorite wife, so he occupies a special place in in that hierarchy as well. But he'll send to ten of his sons off that might meet with disaster. Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. It's as simple as that. No yep. other comment. Yep. <laughs> yep. He apparently will. Okay. okay. Yeah, Gail. Okay. When I 
found interesting about this whole story and from beginning to end is the dream element. When sure. he's confronting his brothers for the first time, he remembers his original dream, which takes us back. He remembers his dream that he had about his brothers bowing down to him. And he goes, right. ah, ah, okay. Uh -huh. The next is, in the sequence of the whole story, Joseph has a dream when he's in prison. That leads to the cupbearer remembering him and bringing him up to the position he now holds. And now he's confronting his brother. So this dream element is, is, is from the very beginning almost to the very end. Very important, but kind of a hidden I don't know, story somehow. I, I've never heard anybody really relate about, you know, do a, a long talk about dreams, particularly in Judaism. Um, remind me and we'll do it sometime. <laughs> yeah, the definite, definitely. And there's, there, there's a major difference, not only in the, in the terminology, but in the way of understanding between a dream and a vision, okay? <laughs> Uh, there's definitely a you know a, a, a major a major difference there, but yes, Joseph Joseph is the dreamer. Joseph is the dreamer, not only in the biblical text, not only in the commentators, but also even if you've ever seen the Broadway show, Joseph and the American the the multicolor dream coat or whatever it's called. Uh, you know he says I, I dream and I dream a dream. You know that's my that's my role in life is to be the dream. Well, Steve, I know you wanted to get in. Oh, yeah. Well, I just wanted to mention to Gail that, you know, I was looking at the Chabad website uh, this morning, Chabad.org. Uh, uh, it's spelled, you know, C-H-A-B-B-A-D. I think. And, uh, there's actually, you know, you can go into the Parsha and see discussion on it. And there's quite a bit of discussion that's quoted from uh, the Talmud, where the rabbis do a lot of discussion of, of dreams and dream interpretation, which is kind right. of interesting because, of course, every, uh, every uh, culture has its own uh, uh, sort of style of, of dream interpretation, but dream interpretation is a very, mm -hmm. very big subject. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. We'll look at it someday. <laughs> we'll, we'll work with it. Right. Um, Oh, I, okay. I just wanted to add one yeah. thing, Rabbi. Start the dream, the dream that he has, and then he relates it to his brother, brothers, which makes them angry. It starts the whole sequence of events by him talking about his dream. It started the whole mess. <laughs> um. Uh... Well, it, it it certainly exacerbates the whole mess. I'm not sure that that was the first. Because earlier it says that he could not br bring himself to say say any kind words about his brother. No, no, no. Brothers. I was talking about I was talking about when he had the dream when he was still with his family. Right. No, 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 no. It's all. It also says brother, that, you know. I think we're we're, we're told we're told that you know Joseph Joseph fav Jacob favored Joseph, and uh, his brothers were aware of that, and they couldn't say a good word about him, and he brings bad reports about them. It's you know, so it already it, it already exists before the dream. Okay, so I, I want I want to look at the question of Joseph's motivations in the way that he treats his brothers when they when they do come at at first, and from the standpoint of of Jewish values again, uh, we we refer to the quote in my favorite Torah portion my bar mitzvah portion in Leviticus and in, in, in Kedoshim, uh, lo tikon velo titor, do not, do not um, uh, bear a grudge, uh, you know, do, do not um, uh, uh, seek revenge, you know, again, be, God, it, it was one of God's commandments. Okay, so um, uh, Abravanel, <laughs> who's Spanish at the time of the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Inquisition, right before 1492. He's actually a financial advisor to Ferdinand and Isabella. Um, is very politically involved in the, uh, in, in the court. Um, and, and so he asks, 
why why did Joseph denounce denounce his brothers? Is it is it revenge? Is it is he holding a grudge? He he knows already that God intended this was all part of God's plan. Uh, this is according to Abravanel. Now we'll we'll run. Joseph will use that phrase on his deathbed, but um, uh, uh, he, Abravanel puts it in Joseph's mind already at this point, that this was all part of God's plan. God intended it for good, even if the brothers had evil intent originally. Um, uh, uh, he, he suffered in jail, but ultimately became a powerful leader. That was all part of the plan. So, so why should Joseph hold a grudge against his brothers? Why should he seek revenge? Why not show compassion for them and their famine? And why not reach out to Jacob? Once he, re once he was in a, pow a powerful position, influential in the government, he could have sent an army to go fetch dad. You know, why, even if he didn't want to help his brothers, he could have gone back and find out what, what was going on with, uh, with, with Jacob. When he ultimately, next week, when he ultimately does reveal himself, he says, uh, I am Joseph, your brothers. How is dad? You know, ha shalom lo. What, what's happening with dad? What, if he was so important in Egypt, why didn't he, why didn't he find that out? Did, was, did he still hold a grudge against his dad? What, you know, what was, what was going on? Um, the, um, and then, uh, so uh, Abravanel bases his commentary or his question on this issue of what was Joseph's motivation um, on the, there's a midrashic, it's called the Sifra. There's a midrashic interpretation of, uh, of the quote, the, mid, the mitzvah that I said in Leviticus, that um, if you refuse assistance to a neighbor, or in this case to his brother, if you refuse assistance because of their unkindness to you, that's revenge. If you grant their request for assistance, but constantly remind them of it, hold them over, you know, hold it over them, that's bearing a grudge. So that's that's what I wanted to point out from Abravanel as as he looks at Joseph's motivations. An earlier commentator is uh, Nachmanides. That's um, Ramban Moses ben Nachman, who's back in the thirteenth thirteenth century. Um, uh, Nachmanides is more of a, a, a peacemaker. Uh, he tries to reconcile. He tries to have the a good ending. To, to, to everything. It's called in, in uh, rabbinic literature, it's called nechemta. It tries, tries to have everything ends with, a, with an understanding and, a, and, and uh, okay, we can be relieved. We can move, we can move, move ahead now accepting this. Um, Nachmanides says, Ramban says, uh, Joseph's not guilty of revenge. He's only carrying out the predictions, like Gail was saying, he he he's he's saying, aha, this is what that dream meant. Okay, this is exactly it's now exactly exactly what what happening. So I'm not I'm I'm not looking for them. I'm not ordering them to bow down to me. They're choosing to bow down to me. This is not revenge at all. The brothers um, the brothers should have accepted his. Uh, his uh, being in a different position, his favorite, his favorite, his status as, as favorite son. Joseph's actions towards his brothers were to carry out everything appropriate to his youthful dreams, because dad and mom never said to them, "No, <laughs> no, no, Joseph." Okay, no, 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 no. This is not the case. Then a further commentator is actually our generation, and that's Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel has a, 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 a midrash, if you will, about Joseph in this, uh, in this setting. Wiesel condemns Joseph. Wiesel sees this whole, the whole play of this chapter that we read and what's going to happen next week. Wiesel sees it all as definitely as revenge, that Joseph 
is embarrassing them. Joseph is uh, lording over them. Um, uh, he rebukes them. He demands, demands, first he demands all of them to be hostages. Then he, then he modifies it a little bit and says, I'm just going to keep one as a hostage. Instead of, instead of welcoming them, he makes them tremble. That's, that's Wiesel's quote. Um, and then winds up torturing them emotionally, mentally for, for weeks. And the pain extends even to Jacob as well. What's, what's going on here? Why is this man doing doing this? So that just that's a little bit of background from from Jewish tradition um, and some of the commentators. I would ask anybody who's with us in the discussion this morning for a couple of minutes. What do you think, Joseph? What was his motivation? Was he was was he was it, was this payback time? Was he? Uh, you know, was he trying to maybe even, I've heard one thing, he was even trying to impress Pharaoh and trying to impress the, you know, his underlings of, you know, don't, don't come off as being too, too generous uh, to these, uh, these foreigners, whatever. Okay. Bev looks like you want to say something. I think Wiesel was spot on. I think that, um, especially when he keeps putting the money back into the sacks. And I mean, that is torture. You know, they feel threatened, you know, and, and, and you have to ask for the younger son, the youngest son who is the most valued. I mean, he knows his father. I mean, he knows that this is going to be the most terrifying, you know, because it, you know, it's not just for that his father's going to be terrified, but the, that the sons asking his father to give up this son are going to be terrified of asking the father. So yeah, this is definitely revenge. Okay. See? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm seeing this more from the dramatic standpoint. You know, that what, what we read in the Torah, when we read stories, they're always gripping stories, or at least they mm -hmm. try to be interesting stories, not just dry narrative well there is some dry narrative but but this obviously is not this was intended to be a story and i think when we're reading a story we want to see people acting like people not and, and people are acting imperfect like people, so, so like people oh, well, acting quote unquote normally or yeah. you want to see them acting on a higher plane no no not not necessarily acting, it's not necessarily a morality uh, play. We, we want to see them acting like we would expect a person to act. Joseph was sold into slavery. Yeah, he's got a grudge <laughs> about that. He's had a pretty rough time. And the reader probably, most readers would think he's entitled to a little payback. I mean, ultimately, he does embrace his brother. Right. He's got a happy ending. He embraces his brothers. He does give them what they want. He stops jerking them around. But until that happens, he gets a little satisfaction. And we get a little satisfaction reading the story. He, so he put he has he has <laughs> his people put their money, the money with which they purchased rations. He has them, he has that money put back in their in their sacks. Okay. Yes. They assume the brothers assume that that's so that, that be, so that they might be accused of being robbers. Right. They're, uh, but, okay. and, they're, and they're also... But, but no, really... no one says, no, that's an act of compassion. Mm -hmm. No, no, no well, be, yeah. be, be, because obviously, well, you know, as from my reading of the story, they're just going to be very, very worried. They're not going to have any idea how that money found its way back into their sacks. They just know yeah. that, you know, that's so preposterous that he's not going to believe us he's going to say we stole the money you know how, how can you explain yeah. all that we don't have an explanation for it so well our explanation is we're going to tell we're going to tell dad that god did it god god put it uh -huh. right okay because dad dad will understand that ricky yeah i compare this to um uh jacob's reaction when he first saw esau 
which was very favorable. And now we have Joseph's reaction when he first sees the brothers. The acting is totally different. Um, I mean, I just, I, there's, there's such a, um, I can't find the word in English, but I can't find the word in any language. Um, the two are so opposite each other um, that Contradiction. Esau, yeah. huh? Uh, contradiction. Con that, that, thank you. I mean, so yeah. they're so contradictory that Jacob's reaction to seeing his brother after all the years and Joseph's reaction to seeing his brothers after all these years is so, so contradictory as to like, what is the message was trying to get from this, these storylines in the, the, in the Torah? We're getting opposite stories, opposite. Um, we're supposed to learn how to live life through this book. Which, which life are we supposed to go by? And I keep, I keep coming back to that other one of why didn't Joseph try to reach out to Jacob? How would he do that? They didn't have email. I would, well, he, could, he, he was second in command of the country. He could send a whole army. Go fetch dad. You know, my dad's living in such and such. You know, what, well, well, he, he's, he he's, he's the vizier. He's, he's only in charge of provisions. He doesn't have an army. Nah, <laughs> could make it. <laughs> that's, that's uh-oh, my email went down. I didn't. Oh, I, actually, you know. if, 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 I, right. if I could quickly ins insert insert yeah. just something that that i found interesting about about the language you know they what the word that's used for pr provisions in the parsha is shever uh-huh shever and, and that's the root and that actually means like a fracture or a break or a yeah. piece of something it's something that broke off it's a very but i you know i looked it up in archaic hebrew it can mean provisions or right. sustenance, right. apparently. And but what's uh, happened to the and, word? And, 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 right. You know, I've, I found that interesting because the one of the first department stores in Israel was called Ham, How much Ham, beer? Beer. Uh huh. Let's Archan, which is the provisioner to the consumer. Okay, literally, right. but or to the but, needy, to, to yeah. the needy. Tzarchan, yeah, 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 but but um. Yeah, but but it never really made sense. I all you know, not, now it makes sense. All of a sudden, they're using the archaic right, right. word Gail? For, for provisions, Gail, please. just to be fancy. I was just, I just occurred to me, if by putting the money in in the sack, right? That Joseph Joseph had the money, their money put back in their sacks. Right. Yeah. That could have set off a horrible suspicions between the brothers oh you took the money no you took the money back you know that could have set off a horrible horrible set of circumstances and maybe that maybe that was joseph's motivation you mean yeah i mean that could have been to see to see if they would turn nasty. on each other yeah that could have been nasty okay gary yeah um you know you mentioned why he didn't maybe send an army or why he didn't reach out to his father much sooner you know i mean even before they came uh, he was in a position where he could have could have done that obviously and i, I just go back to the previous uh parsha and uh, you know i know he was really spoiled and he was really favored by his father but uh his father did uh give him a hard time about the sharing of those dreams with his brother his father was the one that sent him out to meet his brothers out there where they ultimately, you know, um, tried to do away with him. And I, I just, I kind of wonder, you know, if maybe he's not, not feeling as close to anybody in his family, including his father, um, mm. for what he's gone through and, you know, where he is now and whether, you know, he's oh. waiting for somebody, you know, waiting for them to reach out to him rather than him to reach out to them. I don't know. Okay. Okay, good. Let's let's shift for a, for a few minutes that we have less. Let's shift to trying to understand Jacob. Okay, um, Jacob uh, doesn't really know exactly how how to respond when the boys come back and say we met this man in Egypt, and this is this is the situation that he's put us in. Okay, um, Jacob is, at first is angry with uh, with his sons. 
it, and you know, it, it's always me. You know, wh why do I have to? Why do I have to suffer? I'm the one who's yeah. going to be bereaved. I I lost <laughs> Joseph, and uh, I don't know what's gonna, if I'm ever going to see Simeon, Shimon again. And now you want to take Benjamin? Absolutely not. Okay, absolutely not. Um, um, and then um, then uh, 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 Reuben comes forward and says, "Tell you what, if." If uh, uh, you know Simeon and or Benjamin are harmed, you can kill my sons. You know I, I the, the, I'll swear. And it, Jacob says the midrash. Jacob looks back at him and says, well, "I'm going I'm gonna have to endure the, the death of my grandsons as well. I mean, it's bad enough that you're putting me in the position of with my own sons now, my grandsons. Uh, you know, so he he he." he He's, uh, he's really, really grieving, really grieving from here. The, fa the famine is finally uh, so bad that Judah pleads with him and Jacob finally says, okay, que sera, sera. You know, if, if this is what it has to be, this is, this is what it has to be. That's que sera, sera is the translation of uh, chapter 14, <laughs> chapter 43, verse 14. If, if, if you, if, if you will. Um, uh, but the, the, the question kind of is, why does Jacob finally give in? What does, does he, does there all of a sudden is this light bulb that's going on and says, wait a minute, maybe there, maybe this is all part of God's plan. Maybe, I don't know if he thinks about Joseph necessarily, but maybe this is what is, uh, uh, you know, has to do with whether it's the original dreams or I just just believe in God. Um, d why all of a sudden does he put put trust in in Judah? So here are a couple of the ways that a couple of the uh, uh, the, the, the commentators respond to respond to Jacob. Uh, Rashi, who was of course is the most famous of the biblical commentators at the time of the Crusades, the 11th century. Um, uh, Rashi basically uh, says that Jacob accepts Ju Judah's argument um, and uh, again wondering is, there, is this a strategy is this, is this coincidence uh, uh, and it, 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 but, it, but the, the Rashi thinks it has to do with timing what Reuben's offer to go, to go back to take Benjamin and uh, try to save Shimon, Simeon, and whatever was was immediately after the return, um, and he, you know, that that Reuben and and he offers his sons and whatever. Reuben sees this as an opportunity where he can stand up and he can become the spokesperson for all for all the brothers, um, uh, and it's immediately after they return. Judah, who uh, of course is going to emerge as the leader. Of all of the of all the brothers, uh, Judah waited until the hunger finally was was so bad that Jacob was now desperate, um, and uh, so Judah says, "Isn't it better to risk sacrificing one of us for the sake of not only the immediate family but for the whole clan? Jacob, you're responsible for the whole clan. We need to get uh, provisions, if you will." Um, Nachmanides, that's, so that's Rashi. Nachmanides, who I mentioned before, goes one step further, that, um, that, um, that Judah had actually told his brothers that this was going to, that this was going to be the plan. We need to just wait until dad's ready. He will come around eventually. And that Judah really steps in as the, uh, as the, as the leader and as the strat the strategic, uh, developer for the family. Um, but then I want to introduce you and in the time that we spend together over the next couple of months, uh, you'll hear me refer to her more often. Um, I don't know, Steve, you may have, I don't know if anybody else spent the time in Israel, but uh, unfortunately she has passed away. But there was a teacher at Hebrew University by the name of Nechama Leibovich. Oh, I've heard of her. Okay. And every American or foreign student from wherever, from wherever in the diaspora, if you came to Jerusalem on a junior year abroad program or a first year graduate school program or whatever it was, 
it was absolutely required that you had to take a Bible class with Professor Nechama Leibovitch. Um, so much so, she was so revered and so respected that the Jewish Agency for Israel, that's the Sachnut, uh, the Jewish Agency for Israel provided a set of her commentaries on the Torah in Hebrew or English or your language of your choice to every student who passed her class. Okay, if you passed her class, and it's not that she was a difficult grader, but if you passed her class, they gave you, and I think it's, well, the Torah is, it's five commentaries. No, it's actually six volumes. Six volumes of her commentary on the Torah. I, I love her commentary. I loved studying with her. I continue to study study her things. So I will be mentioning her frequently, Nechama Leibovitch. Um, but her, her take on spell, this. Please spell that so I can look it up. Um, her last name, I guess in English would be L-E-I-B-O-W-I-T-Z. And her, the, her first name is Nechama. Taught at, at uh, Hebrew University. If you can't find it, let me know and I'll, we'll try alternate trans, alternate spellings. <laughs> okay, but, um, but Nechama Leibovitch, uh, she, she, she argues that, um, that Jacob agreed to all of, all, of, all the ones, including Benjamin, being taken back to English once he, as a result of this, the, the, the final push, the final urging from Judah, and he then, and, and she places words in his mouth that he had to do this for the sake of his own grandchildren. For the sake, uh, in other words, for the sake of the for the sake of the clan, that if he was going to be Yisrael, if he was going to be the leader of the Israelite clan, then he couldn't make a, a, a decision. He couldn't wait any longer, only for the sake of protecting his one favorite new new favorite son Benjamin. But he had to make the best decision for the entire clan, and she says it in, in sense of his grandchildren. Yes, Ruthann. Okay, I'm thinking kind of on the same lines, but what if it was just Benjamin? I mean, we don't know. Benjamin could have gone to Jacob and said, hey, Dad, I'm hungry, and that might have been enough. Yeah, true. I mean, that, that could have been all it was in the first place. <laughs> right, right, it, you know, or, or, or anything, anything like that. Right, right. Um, uh, so th that that's kind of the the, the question um, to to throw out, and we don't have really have time to get into it. But the question is 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 what's going on in Jacob's mind at this point? And he goes from being one who's more concerned about his personal sense of loss. And what it's going to mean for him, you know, it's always me. I'm the one who has to give up something. I'm the one, da 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 da, da. and and uh, and uh, uh, but ultimately he he agrees after after a while when the the famine has gotten to be so terrible in the land of Goshen, but also when he is reminded whether it's by Judah, whether it's by Benjamin, but he's reminded that he's the leader of the, and he has to make this difficult decision. For the sake of of the larger population, if you will, for the sake of the whole the whole people, and not just for what it means for him personally. Um, uh, comments about what that means to a present political situation in the in the United States uh, aside, we won't we won't <laughs> get into that. That's a different kind of kind of sermon, if you will. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention, if you wanted to. Uh, to uh, to look at it um, and and try to find your own connection as to why it's there, the the haftarah, the haftarah portion for um, for this this week, and I'm going to get you the exact. Uh, I had it and then I lost my uh, I lost my place. The um, the haftarah Kings one. for the portion of Miketz includes 
the familiar story. Where am I going to find it here? Kings. Um, I can't. I can't find it offhand. I had my bookmark, and it's not there. It includes the familiar story of King Solomon and the two women who each claim the the, the same baby. Okay, and Solomon says. Oh well, in order to figure figure out which one's the real mother, we're gonna cut we're gonna cut the baby in half. All right. And the real the the actual mother um, says, no, no, don't do that. Let the baby, let the baby live. And Solomon says, aha, that proves to me that you're that you're the real mother. Okay. Um, you know, so in you know, it's it's in it's in the book of Kings, and I can't I can't find the exact reference right right here on my notes. I thought I had it, but I don't. Um, the, um, uh, you know, and sometimes you, wh what's the connection? Why did the rabbis choose that particular portion for this Torah portion where Jacob has to decide between, uh, you know, making, making, uh, making a, uh, a decision on behalf just of, of what it means for himself or what it means for the larger population and the larger family, if 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 you will, is that is that the connection between Torah and and Haftarah? But um, our our time is up. But that's the way that I I saw this kind of once a month uh, and and Monday morning if it works, we'll, we'll try it for a couple of months and then and see what goes. So if if there are people who would as Gary did, and I'm appreciative. Uh, who over the next couple of weeks would volunteer to do a, a little couple minute summary of the particular Torah portion as, as we get to it. Uh, the next time that we meet the, uh, on the calendar would, would be January 11th. Um, and the, uh, the, so there the three weeks in between would be the last two portions of the book of Genesis that brings that concludes the Joseph the Joseph cycle the Joseph narrative if you will and then the first portion in the book of Exodus where we're introduced to Moses and then we'll we'll focus and do most of the conversation on the second uh, the second portion in um, uh, in the book of, uh, of, of Exodus, which is uh, Moses at the burning bush and uh, Moses accepting the, the call to go back to Pharaoh and uh, say the famous words, let my people go, right? Um, anybody have any last, last questions or comments? Rabbi, I was just going to mention for everybody on, on page uh, on the uh Tanaka we usually use on page 522 and it's um in three three fifteen to four one is that section you're talking about uh, in the uh, half torah okay what where's it what does it come from book of kings it should yeah, say it on there somewhere in kings yeah yeah kings yeah first kings second kings first kings probably yeah should be. yeah first kings 522 got and it 315 to 41 is the section Rate it Thank you, Gary. And Rabbi, of course, I, I, will, I would love to volunteer to do that. If you want to assign me a portion of some time, I'd be honored to uh, volunteer. All right. We will be in touch. Thank you, David. Thank you. Ricky, you had your hand up? Yes. This is, when this class is over, I have uh, something for the group. For the I group. had a okay. little, little a dreidel made of glass. <laughs> okay. I'm not yeah. sure everyone gets what we're talking about. Well, enough of us were yesterday's thing. All right. Um, and when it comes to my turn, I think I'll say I pass. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was very careful how to Good keep save. that one clean. Good save, as we say. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. So thanks, everybody. I wish you again a continuing happy, happy, festive Hanukkah. Be safe. Be careful. <laughs> And we will see each other soon. Okay. Thanks. And Rabbi, thank you so much for yeah. this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. No, 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 no. Leave. Leave. <laughs> Leave.
There. Okay. Unless, I mean, Bev, you're, oops, well, missed.